Welcome to the Maritime Executives Podcast Series, In the Know. I'm Tony Munoz, Editor-in-Chief. Our Executive Corner Podcast will provide conversations with top executives concerning events and issues that are shaping our industry today. We will also bring you up to speed with the latest news and editorials covered by the Maritime Executive. Hello, I'm Audrey Mejia, Assistant Editor at the Maritime Executive, and on today's episode of In the Know, we'll discuss with Eric DeWicke, President of Northeast Maritime Institute's Ocean Policy and Economics, about whether a USVI registry can revitalize U.S. maritime. Good morning, Eric. How are you? Good morning, Tony. How are you? I'm, I'm excellent. I'm excellent. Um, you know, you, you are bringing forward a, a very interesting uh, change in uh, the way the U.S. maritime is being uh, viewed and possibly could be. You're an advocate of the uh, U.S. Virgin Island Registry based on national security and transparency. How would the uh, registry change the current deep water flag situation, which today gets little or no attention from the government nor the industry? Sure, Tony, thanks for that question. The, the tough reality that the United States is in is we have no capacity or oversight over deep water interests coming into the United States. We only have about, we, we say 0.4%, but it's actually about 2.2%. Uh, of internationally uh, or U.S. registered vessels trading internationally. And that's only 28 vessels operating on the free and open market space. So when you think about only 28 U.S. flag vessels operating overseas in, in an open international marketplace, it, it really is from a trade and commerce standpoint, it, it is abhorrent. It, it is something that is almost just unimaginable. This is the United States. But when you think about security, we basically, after 9-11, we put our, all of our eggs in the, the one basket of port state control. And so we are supposed to inspect every container that comes out into the United States. We're basically supposed to inspect every vessel that comes into the United States. And that's just impossible to do. So under SOLAS and under the origins of how our international treaty instruments operate and function, the way to really look at security is through the overt instruments such as SOLAS, MARPOL, STCW, the Maritime Labor Convention, and really inspect these vessels as flag states. And when you look at flag states' responsibilities, over the years, we have basically parsed that out to open international flags. Some people call them flags of convenience. Well, those flags of convenience or those open international flags, they really do not communicate openly and transparently enough. There are some good ones. There are some really, really, really bad ones. And most of them just do not have the interest. Let me interject in something States. here, if I could. Sure. Um, you know, after 9-11, after they did everything electronically at both ends to see who was shipping cargoes in. So I think from that measure, you know, it's on export declarations or import um, uh, documents. Um, so if you're shipping a thousand containers a month, you know, there's really not a need to inspect. This whole thing was primarily about, you know, the, the new guy on the block who was shipping and they were going to inspect them and do all that. That's, that's one issue. And the other issue is not a USVI registry and open flag of convenience registry. No. So, okay. so let, me, let me go back to your, your okay. analysis on the cargo. Okay. With respect, I disagree. Okay. That, that is not happening. It, it is not happening at all. You, 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 you are talking about shippers, you're protecting shippers, the massive shippers that are shipping loads and loads of containers into the United States. And we simply turn a blind eye to them because they have a long history, et cetera, et cetera. Well, if I'm, if I'm Osama bin Laden 
and I want to hide. I'm going to go hide in a city. And I'm going to go hide in a place where I have the most volume of people of, in this case, cargo. And, and I'm going to easily get through. We do not inspect cargo being loaded in these containers. That is one of the, the, the fallacies of this oversight. We need to be inspecting uh, containers from load to discharge. And, and that's what has to change. And again, I think the, sh the, the major shippers, the big guys, they want that. They want that transparency. But we have to enable a system that does that. When it comes to when it comes to the flag of convenience, this isn't a flag of convenience. This is a flag of responsibility. This is a flag that will actually have higher standards than what we have on the books for the U.S. flag today. We will be including a uh, our own Maritime Act that will, in fact, uh, have greater standards than the Maritime Labor Convention. We, we are going to be bringing in a group of people for each section of our Maritime Act that will include the experts and stakeholders, and we will sit around the table and we will draft legislation that absolutely ensures transparency and absolutely ensures human rights at sea and absolutely ensures that environmental protection uh, standards are in place and communication standards are in place. And that will be monitoring 24 hours a day, seven well, days a you're, week. You're, you're saying that we should create a whole new oversight, regulatory uh, oversight environment for um, the shipping industry, which basically is already there. You want to enhance it and you want to do that with the registry. Um, okay, so that's great, but how do you get stakeholders to join? How do you get operators to join? Now, one of the things that I, I think in question number two is how, how do you get foreign flags to flag in the United States and become now under the scrutiny of US labor laws and US taxation, which they're not, and as you know, it's, it's, it's pretty rough here, you know, labor laws, taxation laws, uh, shipping requirements. Now we're going to have more enhanced shipping requirements. How do you get that off the ground? Well, in, in terms of getting them excited to come in, they know that they are competing with substandard shippers and in really non-compliant shippers. And what they wanna do is be able to raise the bar and make sure that there is a fair and even playing field that everybody can participate in, but it has to be done in a transparent way. And it's just not being done that way, especially you know, in, in the Pacific, there's major, major deltas in how shipping is conducted. That's not going to help us out environmentally. This is from a security standpoint, it's not helping us out. And so when I've talked to shippers, shippers, the cargo owners over the last two years, they are excited and they are going to ensure that this bar is measured in a way that they know that they're doing the socially responsible thing and ensuring that people operating ships are doing it by the book. And, and they're going to be the ones dictating what flag is being used for the shipping companies using flags. So what and, branch and of the government is going to be tasked with this new oversight? So the oversight, we are hoping legislatively that the oversight and the enforcement piece will be conducted by the Coast Guard, as well as Customs and Border Patrol. We want to basically share every ounce of data with those two organizations or more. Uh, that's yet to be determined as to the whole package. But basically what we want to do is be able to share the data so they can basically make better decisions as to what vessels they're going to inspect. Again, that data needs to be raw, it needs to be transparent, it needs to give them the capacity to really manage their human resources, which really are all at an all-time low when you look at the volume 
or the capacity of vessels coming into the United States. So we've got to give them the tools to do their job better. And that's the whole goal of this project is making sure we give these agencies the right tools to, to make these decisions. So um, the next piece of that is labor. Mm -hmm. And, you know, your um, manifesto says that we want to create more jobs for our academy grads. We want to give them more opportunities um, besides the Jones Act, besides working on a tugboat. We want to put them on ships. And um, but forever that has been the U.S merchant seamen has cost more. You and I spoke earlier and we got into a little bit of debate about that. And you said, well, not so much. There's a lot of foreign guys who are making a lot of money running ships. And so let's talk about that. Let's talk about the labor uh, part of being able to create this a uh, new registry that provides more opportunities for U.S. merchant seamen. So I learned a little bit more since we spoke about that. Okay. And I'm excited <laughs> about learning what I learned from one of the, the, actually, I think the most solid union in the United States. We had a meeting uh, with those guys and we had a really productive conversation. Turns out the U.S. Uh, mariners are only making about 16% more than kind of the flat line around the world. And this is from the union, which was, I found to be very, very interesting and, and honestly exciting. And so when we talked about coming up with this, this differential, what we figured out is we have the ability through the USVI uh, in their basically economic free zone to look at the potential of waiving income taxes for US citizens functioning and operating under this USVI flag. Now that's big news and, and we're working on it and it's just something that the dialogue started as a result of this meeting with the union. And in fact, we can do this. Uh, we, we know we can do this because basically the Supreme Court ruled that businesses uh, are considered people. Inversely, people of course can they, be considered <laughs> businesses. Of course, right? they, 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 that, that's so, why you have Citizens United, et cetera. And, and that's, that's, that's a flawed decision in my opinion. Yeah. However, we're going to take advantage of that decision for our merchant mariners. And we are going to work hard on really making sure we can take that and turn the tide for, for the people working at sea. They must, in order for the United States to compete, they must have support. And I think this support is a mechanism. And this was a great idea by the union, this particular union. And we've reached out and we see an opening and an opportunity to, to do that. And again, the U.S. Virgin Islands in, in St. Croix has this economic free zone that basically will only charge 10.5% income tax federally. And they have the license to do that. So this is a great uh, okay. opening. It's, it not only you know, meets that delta, but actually expands it. It makes gives them more earnability than what we're seeing internationally. Well, it'd, be, it'd be interesting to see if you can move not paying federal taxes on. Merchant. Well, they're going to pay. They're going to pay okay. only ten point five percent as okay. their corporate status is. Okay. And so, and I and I can't guarantee that yet, but we see that there's a major opportunity, and and I think Tony, you know me, if if. If I think it can happen, it's probably going to happen. Um, and, and I think uh, the good news is the lawyers are agreeing with me. And, and, and so a, a furtherance of that um, that I brought forward is also that um, the USVI would be a 501C. Therefore, it would not have the expenses that it would have to show uh, a nonprofit. And uh, so the, it, its taxation um, would uh, be um, more 
to the um, 501C, which really doesn't pay any taxes, but files taxes. So the reg I, I think the original uh, issue was that some of the unions and their and their pushback on the USVI was that um, it was primarily just for the registry fees, and so that was its primary way of getting money. So you'll still get the registry fees, but you'll be a 501c. You won't make a profit. That's correct. We, you know, we are, the irony is we are transitioning. Uh, Northeast Maritime Institute has the agreement with the USVI to pull all this together. Our family decided to transition the institute into a 501c3. Um, really just to donate it. It's, it's done a lot of great things. We've been able to do a lot of great things with it. However, we're going to stand up the ship registry independently of the Institute and the Center for Ocean Policy and Economics. That will be its own 501c3. Um, and that will be a nonprofit organization. It will not drive the, our operations for profit um, I did not want that on the table. Um, I'm at the end of my career. I've, I've, I really believe that, you know, I've been more than blessed. blessed. Um, when I say end of my career, I've got maybe 10 or 15 more years to, to work. But the reality is I want to see this thing last forever. This is, this is a piece of work that we can leave, you know, society. It's almost like ABS as a nonprofit. And the reality is it continues on. ABS is, is the longest, uh, the, it, it's older than the US Coast Guard, by the way. And so here's an organization that has kept itself going, kept itself going, transitioned from leadership to leadership. And I wanna do the same thing with the USBI flag. And I wanna make sure we are benefiting the public. This isn't about any one individual, or any one company. This is about the United States becoming competitive in an industry that is no longer competitive. Okay, so how, how about the unions? Let's talk about them. They're a major player in labor in the United States. You're gonna become a US registry, a US flag. Um, what's the pushback from them? Um, I think overall, yeah, we, the consensus we, is that they're really not interested, but you've obviously been talking to them and you have one or two interested in this as an opportunity to get more jobs for their, for their uh, members. And uh, so, but they are a major part of your strategy of having a U.S. flag. So yep. how do you get them on board? The unions are very, very important to this process not only the unions, the academies, and all of the two-year schools that are sprouting up around the country. We believe we're going to create thousands and thousands of new jobs. And in order to do that, the unions really have to participate in the workforce development strategy of this project. We, we don't care if you're union or non-union. What we care about is that you are creating opportunities for people to get well-paying jobs. And we want the unions to participate in the dialogue. And the good news is one union did figure out, hey, this is an opportunity for us. We're going to reach out. We're going to sit down. We had a great lunch in D.C. last week. And they figured out full stop that, hey, this is a great opportunity for our members. It's about the membership. It's not about the leadership. It's about right. the members. That it, it, and, and, you know, enough is enough on the hyperbole and, and frankly, the lies, we need to take care of the people. My father was a union member for 43 years. My grandfather was a union member. I was a union member in both the NMU and the MEBA. And I understand what it is to have to work hard to get a job. I loved my, my, my days at sea. And, and there was no... Um, there, there is no uh, heartburn over unions. I want to see them thrive and I want to see them succeed. Okay. And I think they're good for, uh, especially the maritime security and uh, for maintaining uh, well-educated um, 
commercial mariner. I, I think yep. they've done a remarkable job at advancing um, our skill levels here in the United States. So let's absolutely shift gears, let's absolutely. shift gears a little bit and let's go to the place where we're bringing in foreign flags. Okay, now if I'm a shipper, if I'm a shipping company, and I'm shipping from Europe, I'm going to New York or one of the other big ports. If I'm coming through the Panama Canal, I'm going to make a left turn and shoot up to Tampa. Um, if I'm, um, uh, yeah, I, I, and then on the Pacific Coast, uh, but we're not talking about the Pacific Coast, are we? We're talking primarily the East Coast, right? The, the okay. East Coast so, and Gulf Coast, yes. And the Gulf Coast. So, so we're we're talking about shipping companies coming up from South America, from West Africa, and some from Europe. And they're all going to go and transship their cargo uh, in the United Virgin Islands, U.S. Virgin Islands. And that transship cargo is going to go to tier two and three ports, not to Tampa, but Mobile was the name that you had mentioned. And your suggestion was, is that the United States government needs to invest more in tier two and tier three for infrastructure reasons, which we have all understood because the congestion at uh, LA Long Beach, some of the other major ports in the nation um, and the just in time scenario just just doesn't work anymore so that that that's kind of your infrastructure of how you're going to move this forward what entices people to come to the usvi and transship and then we're going to have to build those new ships as well is that correct yeah so the the opportunity with the transshipment hub is basically um, we will create green lanes. We will basically create opportunities for uh, this data management system to really expedite cargo. However, you know, when we look at the, the transshipment opportunities and the short sea shipping opportunities to go to the, the tier two and three ports, it's really driven by the congestion of the I-10 and I-95 corridors. They've been congested since the 80s and 90s. We've done nothing about expanding those, those highways. So essentially, as the pop, when you look at the population growth in the United States, it's going to squeeze and squeeze and squeeze those, those highways and, and even those rail systems. So what we need to look at is how do we work with the Tier 2 and Tier 3 ports along the eastern seaboard and the Gulf Coast and essentially redistribute to those uh, ports for the, the smaller distribution platforms. It won't be everybody. We, we need those larger ports such as Tampa. We absolutely need those larger ports, but we are going to be growing so much and we're going to be not only importing, but exporting is starting to grow as well in the United States. And so we can redistribute um, from that transshipment hub in, in a greater capacity. There will also be tax benefits for, for companies shipping out of the, the transshipment hub as well. And, and again, our job is to really excite foreign investors to not only invest in running their cargo through <laughs> this U.S. port and these tier two and three ports, but we're, we're now looking at you know, making sure the ships are investing in the United States, the ship owners are investing in the United States. And really the exciting part for me is the development of the short sea shipping hubs, because that is not only going to excite right. um, the, the transshipment to these tier two and three ports, it's going to actually excite shipbuilding again in the United States. When people say that shipbuilding in the United States is dead, they're flat wrong. No, we're not building big tankers and we're not building big container ships, but we are building ships that Absolutely. are very large. You know, when we look at Texas and we look at Louisiana and we look at Alabama and, and you know, and we look at um, Mississippi, Mississippi is building some of the, the most complicated, technologically advanced ships in the country right now. Yeah, Louisiana yeah. as well. 
No, no question ships. the Jones Act is very sophisticated, probably the newest fleet in the world. And yeah. uh, the mariners that operate there are as well. Um, and, and that's kudos to the, the ship in, building industry, keeping their eye on the ball and, and building technology for whether it's deep water or inland waterways. Or I, I, I think the American shipbuilding industry could use a lift and perhaps this will do it for them. And as far as jobs, I think that's great too. Okay, who's going to manage the um, registry? Is it going to be government? Is it going to be private? Who will be managing USVI registry? So it'll be a group of private citizens under the 501c3. We will be, my goal is to bring in the A-team. Uh, we bring in some of the best uh, regulators from the multiple agencies that are going to be involved, uh, retirees, people that have been in the business as well. I will help out in the beginning, um, but my intention is to let, let some folks learn it and, and move in and even bring in people that know more than me. Um, and, um, you know, I, I am excited about that. The key is, is this organization will also have MOUs with the re relevant uh, government bodies to make sure they're participating on a daily basis as well. So, so it's going to be privately managed? Privately managed through the 501c3, yes. Okay, so um, my final question is, how can the USBI registry revitalize the US merchant marine? I mean, we understand that what, we have less than 100 ships, that uh, the primary uh, ship is over 30 years old, that they, they primarily deliver food goods to Djibouti and places like that, um, not a lot of money in it. So you, you're going to change that dynamic by creating this registry, which will be required to have new transshipment ships. Um, do you believe that that uh, would lead to more deep water ships and put U.S. flags in Singapore and Hamburg and uh, Abu Dhabi or wherever they're going to be? Uh, do you believe that that's the long-term effect of this? I absolutely do. That, that's where uh, th this is going. Um, I think the fun part is in, in talking to the shippers um, over the last couple of years, they're going to really kind of demand um, that their cargoes end up being shipped on USBI vessels. We're putting together a, a consortium of shippers right now, um, both U.S. and European interests. And the nice part is our U.S. flag, our secondary U.S. flag under the USBI will be showing up in Singapore and Abu Dhabi and in all of these major ports around the world. And, um, and I think the exciting part for me, uh, where my heart is, is with the Mariners, they will have opportunities for these jobs. And, and I think I'm, I'm really excited that we'll be building, you know, short sea shipping vessels to trade from St. Croix, the, the Hamilton transshipment hub to the United States. Uh, continental United States, and those jobs will be, we will be creating a set aside for U.S. merchant mariners on those vessels, and that's where my heart is, and, and I, I really can't wait to see that develop. Good luck, and thank Tony, you. Tony, thanks time. so much for, thanks so much for your support. Really, truly appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. See ya. Thank you for listening to In the Know, the Maritime Executive Podcast. We hope you'll join us again for our next exciting industry discussion. In the meantime, you can visit us at maritime-executive.com for top news on critical maritime issues.